Good afternoon, and welcome to the next Computer Science and Engineering Distinguished Lecture. I am thrilled to introduce today Morella Lapata, who is professor in the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh. So she came here all the way from Scotland, where it's even darker. Nine hours, Nine hours and, it's, and it's darker and rainier there than it is here. Um, so we are, we are thrilled to have Morella. The NLP group has known her for a long time. She has worked on many problems in natural language processing. Uh, so you're only going to get a slice of the many things she's done today. But we're, we're very excited about this talk. Um, I was trying to think of an embarrassing story uh, to share about Morella, but I couldn't think of any. They were all more embarrassing to me than they were to her. So I, with that, I will, I will simply say that she's won many awards in our field, and we're super excited to have her here. So please give her a warm welcome. So when Noah said to me, come and give this talk, he said, I said to him, right, but what do you want me to talk about? And he said, make it broad. Now, this is hard. Anyway, so this is the broadest I can come up with. Um, and uh, this talk is going to be about movies, which I guess everybody likes and uh, want to watch. And in particular, the question we're trying to ask is, can we analyze the movies? And can we identify who's doing what in the movie? Can we generate a summary of a movie in different modalities, as you shall see? And these are the people involved in this project. There's my student, Philip. and. The two guys at the bottom, Tim and Vittorio, are computer vision experts because we are not, I am not a computer vision person. And uh, the Rick is uh, doing all the graph um, analysis, which you will see in the talk. OK, so this talk has four parts, but really three. And first of all, let me tell you a bit about movies and how they are made. Um, so approximately 250,000 scripts or screenplays are written every year. So take a minute to think about this number. There are a lot of scripts. A lot of people want to be like the next Hollywood success. A single producer may receive a thousand, well, 10,000 scripts per year. Okay, so a script is almost as big as a book, and they have to read these things, pages and pages and pages. On average, out of these, you know, 250,000 scripts that are written, only 50 will make it into the movies. So, and as I say here, the odds of fatally sleeping in a bath are higher than actually making your, your script into a movie. And, and um, you have to understand that somebody needs to read this movie. So this is, uh, throughout the talk, I will be talking about this movie. This is our test case, The Silence of the Lambs. Can I see how many people have seen this movie? Oh, glad, I'm so happy. Okay, I gave this talk three months ago, and I asked, how many people have seen The Silence of the Lambs? So for me, it's like a classic. It's a movie everybody must see. And there was silence. <laughs> you, you can understand how bad it was. OK, I'm so happy you've seen the movie. So OK, so we have these people who get the scripts. And the scripts are like in their thousands. And how do you choose? How do you choose a script to read? Well, Hollywood has thought of this. And there is these guys called readers. This is their actual job. They are getting paid to do this. And they actually read the scripts. And they are on the lookout for interesting to be movies. So, and the readers have to sift through this, this, this pile of scripts. And then they maybe talk to the producer. And the producer may talk to their superior. Now, you may think this is a hard task, because they sit all day and they read. But they are facilitated. by So they're very structured. So not only do they get the script, but they get two more pieces of information called a log line and a synopsis. And I'll show you an example. A log line is something that sells the movie. So for the silence of the lambs, I will read it to you. To enter the mind of a killer, she must challenge the mind of a madman. Very good. No machine can ever do this. OK, and the synopsis, and again, I'm going to read this to you, because if you haven't seen the movie, at least you will get the summary. In this chilling film, so chilling, based on the novel by Thomas Harris, so this is based on a novel we find out, a serial killer is terrorizing the Midwest. And in an effort to catch him, the FBI sends this agent, Clarice Starling, to interview a prisoner who is the psychiatrist, Hannibal Lecter. So already you get the dynamics here. You have an FBI person who is going to interview Hannibal Lecter. And Hannibal Lecter agrees to give insight into the mind of the on-the-loose criminal, a lingering classic filled with gore, mystery, and suspense. 
This is pretty accurate. This is, I don't know about whether it is a classic or not, you can debate this, but it's an accurate summary of what happens. Now, assuming we have a movie like The Silence of the Lambs and we actually want to produce it and assuming that we have actually cast the actors and we shot the movie, then what happens? Then another big um, industry is how to actually generate the advertising for the movie. And this is usually the trailer or the preview. And now, uh, I don't know how much you know about this, but the trailers are uh, very much regulated. There is uh, specific rules that cinematographers abide by in order to generate these trailers. And the most basic rule is that they cannot be beyond two, and two minutes and 30 seconds. If you, you are allowed, um, so some production company is allowed for one movie per year to exceed this limit, but they have to apply specifically to do that. Um, and so Hollywood and LA in particular have these trailer houses that create the trailers and they go through many trailers till they settle on the one that you see in the cinema. So I will just show you, uh, if anything, so that you can make the contrast with what we create later on in the talk, I will show you the official trailer for The Silence of the Lambs. You spook easily, Starling? Not yet, sir. He's past the others. The last cell. I'll be watching. You'll do fine. A killer is on the loose. Keeps them alive for three days. Then he shoots them, skins them, and dumps them. A rookie FBI agent is on his trail. He's got real physical strength, cautious, precise, and he's never impulsive. He'll never stop. But in order to track him down, she'll have to match wits. I'll help you catch him, Clary. Believe me, you don't want Hannibal Lecter inside your head. With the darkest of all minds. Just do your job, but never forget what he is. Oh, he's a monster. Pure psychopath. So rare to capture one alive. So close to the way you're gonna catch him, do you realize that? Oh, Clarice, your problem is you need to get more fun out of life. You told me you don't spook easily. You call this easy, sir? Left his missing hand arm. Man's a raving maniac. Who knows what he'll do? you know the titles okay so this is a professionally made trailer very interesting you get some idea of the story without revealing the ending uh, but some critical scenes are there to whet your appetite and apparently when people make trailers they manipulate not only the story but other things such as what the effect will be of the trailer on the audience so they have they play a lot with sentiment you know you have to um, incite feelings in the audience such as happiness or sadness uh, and so on okay so once we have the movie and we've shot it and we've watched it, then the other thing that people actually do do um, is use these recommender engines that will tell them what movie to watch. And this is uh, an example from Genie. How many here have heard of Genie? No one, yes. So good. So Genie used to be a, a movie recommender engine which was too good for its own sake. And now I think HBO or some of these big networks have bought Genie and you cannot have access to it anymore. But it used to be the case that you would put a query here like, I want to see a feel good witty indie movie and it would return a feel good witty indie movie. Not one, but several. Um, so what else did Genie do? It also would analyze a movie in terms of these genes. Let me find this now here. Okay, so it, they, they have this annotation where humans have sat down and actually labeled all the movies in their database with things like mood, what is the mood, what is the plot, what are the genres, the style. So you get this movie profile that tells you what the movie is about. And then they can do the movie recommendation. So here you can see, I don't know whether you can see the profile, but um, the colors indicate what genes this movie has. So it says that the silence of the lamp, the lamps can be described as tense, captivating, and suspenseful. The plot revolves around special agents and whatnot. And so you get some idea of what this movie is about. 
in fact, more than an idea, because you can see, for example, places where it's taking place, what time, in this case it was 199, and so on. It's based on a book. That's the, if you like, the story of a movie from conception to actual production. Where do we fit in? Uh, and what do we want to do? So our original idea is, and this is a high level goal, is to produce script reading and movie viewing aids. And you may think, okay, but you know, doesn't Hollywood have anything to do with this? I mean, don't they have their own tools? And it turns out, no. Hollywood doesn't have these tools. They want readers to read the scripts. And in fact, readers would hate us because they would lose their job. So in particular, okay, so this is the high level goal. So we're gonna break it down into four things. First of all, if you have a script, can you identify key scenes so as to shorten it? So imagine you are this reader, you don't want to read 100,000 pages, maybe you want to read 20,000 pages. So can you identify the scenes in the script that are important? In order to do that, of course, you have to identify main characters. You don't want to miss out on scenes where the main character gets killed. Then the next step is, okay, we've actually created the movie, can we, create, can we generate a trailer? And finally, can, you produ can we produce a summary of sorts that describes the content of the movie? And I guess more seriously, um, the idea is to see if the task is feasible at all from an NLP and computer vision perspective, because you need to use both, in particular when you generate the trailers. So I've worked in NLP all my life, and you, know, you may hear that this is a mature technology and whatever, the question is, does it actually work when you want to do a task like this? And the same for computer vision. Okay, so before I talk about our approach, um, I'll, I'll mention uh, some related work on this area. Although there is no directly related work, there is some interesting work where people have analyzed literary text. And movies are considered literature. So there is a lot of work trying to identify characters and networks of characters in books, um, their emotional trajectories, whether you know they're happy, then sad, then angry, um, enemies and allies in uh, literature, villains and heroes. Uh, there is some interesting work where they work on film scripts and they try to automate the Bechtel test. How many people have heard of the Bechtel test? Oh good, so for those of you who don't know it, it's a way of quantifying how sexist a movie is, so can you find a movie where you get two women who talk about something else than a man? So most movies score very poorly, well half of the movies actually score badly on the Bechtel test. So the women talk about a man 50% of the time. So they try to automate this using the screenplay. Um, there's also, oops, there's also a lot of work on computer vision uh, where they're trying to do summarization. And you understand why people in computer vision are interested in this because, you know, we all have our cameras, we go out, we film our holidays, and maybe you don't want to see like an hour of footage of the beach. You want to condense this. Now, most techniques, it turns out, use visual information. And in particular, there is this notion of egocentric video summarization where you have a camera on your head and you go about your daily business and the camera records what you're doing and then you want to produce a summary of this. Well, what is interesting though is that none of this work actually goes and looks at the, well, some of it does not directly do movies, but even the work that tries to generate trailers, they don't look at the script in any way. They just try to do it on the visual uh, uh, perspective, which makes the problem harder than it should be because the text is there. It, it, it preceded the movie, actually. Okay, so in order to do this, we had to create a data set. Um, and I will talk about this for one minute and it underlies all the later work. Um, so we created a corpus which has 1,200 scripts. We downloaded them online. If you want to read scripts, they're all over the place on the web. And there were four basic categories, drama, thriller, comedy, and action. And the reason why we picked those is they're the most frequent ones. Um, that th these are the most frequent movies that people will watch uh, if you quantify this on IMDb, for example. So we took these scripts, we paired them with their corresponding movies and closed caption. And yes, we had to buy 1,200 DVDs in order to get the movies and in order to get the captions. 
and they're also paired with gene metadata, so the genes that I showed to you. And I'm not going to talk about this in great detail. In fact, this is the only thing I'm going to say. But all the scripts we have have a lot of linguistic annotation. So we have parsed them. We have done co-reference re resolution on them, semantic role labeling, and sentiment analysis. And uh, we had to do this in order to inform later parts. And there is a lot of work here, which I'm not talking about, as to how you actually do this on the script. Most NLP work works on text. The scripts are interesting because they have dialogue mostly. And there is an interesting question as to whether vanilla NLP technology adapted, can be adapted for dialogue. OK, so if you have never seen before, this is how, uh, seen it before, this is how a screenplay looks like. Um, so we have here some instructions. So it tells us that this is Dr. Lecture Cell, uh, which is becoming slowly into view behind its barred front. So these are. Uh, instructions to the, you know, the director's instructions. Clarice stops at a polite distance, so you, this, then you have to shoot like that. And so we, know, we have these instructions, and then we know who is talking. So we have Clarice, we have Dr. Lecter, there is a cutting here, and then Dr. Lecter and Clarice again. And we also have the video, and we have the closed captions. Um, and now we can align the closed captions here with the turns in the dialogue with whoever is speaking. And if we do this alignment, we know exactly the time information shown here, so when people speak in the movie. And then we can align it also with the video. And so for every bit of text in the screenplay, we have an alignment which is pretty accurate of what the movie of, this, of the shot of the movie, OK? Is this clear? This is kind of critical for the rest of the talk. So if you want me to extract this text, I can play you how it looks like, OK? And I can also grab. So if, if I want to grab particular persons, I can also show you where the particular persons are speaking in the movie, OK? Right. So the first thing we want to do is extract important scenes. And the scenes in the script are actually marked. So it, I don't show it here, but you can tell when a scene begins and a scene ends because it is annotated. The person who is writing the script will say scene one, scene two, scene three. So what we want to do here is as a first task is having the scenario of the script reader who has to read all these pages extract the important scenes. OK? And so the task is to take a script as input and return a shorter script as output. And we know that the script is segmented into scenes. And the task is to select a subchain of scenes where each scene can be seen as a node. So if you have here scene one till five, whereas red shows the selected scenes, one specific output could be that we select scene one, two, and four. And because I showed to you that we have aligned the script with a movie, if you had the movie, you could play this. So you could automatically, if you have a movie, get a summary of the movie. OK? So if you know what the important scenes are, you can just get the movie. OK, so how are we going to formalize this? Um, we have a screenplay which consists of scenes and characters. OK, characters are the important characters in the movie. And we need to find a list of ordered scenes subject to a compression rate. And the compression rate is how big you want the summary to be. And the user sets this. So if I want 20% of the movie, this will be my compression rate. If I want 50%, this can be the compression rate. So this is up to the user, and we need to actually Modulo module this compression rate, we need to find an ordered chain of scenes subject to a function. Right? This function here, this argmax q, this is our function that we need to optimize. And I'll go back. It's kind of important that it's an ordered um, chain of scenes rather than an unordered. And so if I select scene one, three, and five, I cannot go back and select two and four. 
which is kind of a problem because movies have a lot of flashbacks and you go back and forth, but as a first approximation is not so bad. Okay, so now I actually don't, haven't told you what this function is, which is gonna do all the work for us. So this function is broken down into three parts and I'm gonna explain in general terms what each part is and then I'm gonna tell you our specific realization of it. Okay, so this Q function here is made up of three terms and the first one, which is the most important one, is what we call scene to scene progression, which you can think of it, scripts are a story. If we are creating a summary, we don't want the story to be incoherent. We don't want to mess this up. So the scene to scene progression sort of quantifies how coherent or how sensible is your story. And there are many candidates. For example, we can select scene one, two, and four, or we can just select two and four, or two, four, and five. So we have to have a way of actually scoring this and saying, is this a reasonable sh story or not? The other term is called importance. So obviously you want to extract the important scenes, not the unimportant ones. So here um, I'm showing uh, these very two important scenes. Well, um, they're just pictures of the scene. Uh, this is when um, Hannibal Lecter kills a policeman, and the other one is when they find this moth, which is critical for the plot development. The third term is diversity. So you want diverse scenes, not repetitive. So these three scenes here are diverse. It's Clarice, um, this is the, the guy, the killer on the loose, and the dog, this is his dog. So this is diverse as opposed to this here where they're all pictures of Clarice. This would be boring, okay? Now, um, Importantly, the way, I need to say this, importantly, the way this objective is, is uh, formulated, you can do three things. You can just instantiate these terms only based on text. You can instantiate these terms only based on the video, or you can instantiate these terms only, uh, not only, based both on video and text, okay? So if you're only dealing with shortening the script, you can just run these terms on the script corpus. If you don't have the script for some reason, you could potentially do this on the script alone, on the movie alone. And in our case, we are interested in both, of course. Okay, so how are we formulating the scene to scene progression term? It's actually rather intuitive. Um, and we will formulate it as a graph where we have, as a bipartite graph, where we have two kinds of nodes. The top nodes here are the characters, the main characters of the movie, and these are characters from The Silence of the Lambs. I'm not telling you yet how we obtain these characters. It will be revealed in the next couple of slides. Assume I know that these are important characters in The Silence of the Lambs. So I have on the one side characters, and on the other side I have scenes. And this, we didn't think of it ourselves. There is a lot of theory in, in, in film, there is a lot of film theory that actually tells you that the most important thing in movies are the characters. In fact, there is this guy, Monaco, uh, the same as the place, who has written three books, not one, about this thing, that, you know, movies, the most important thing is the characters, and forget location, forget the jokes. So we will measure the scene to scene progression based on the characters and where they appear in the scenes. So this is Clarice. By seeing that, without me telling you anything, you can probably figure out that she's pretty important and that she's in every scene. So if I get rid of some scenes where Clarice is, it's not a big deal, right? Now, what about Hannibal? She's not there very often, but okay, not as much as Clarice, but also quite important. Buffalo, two scenes. And Chilton, Chilton is like the psychiatrist um, in another two scenes. So, what the term on the top says is that I want to find out how I'm going to go from one scene to the next. And in this bipartite graph, how, if I take a random walk from one scene to the next, how likely is it that I'm going to end up in the same scene? If it's likely to end up in the same scene, so I, then I don't need the scene, I can get rid of it. And so the idea is we are measuring how important is a character on its own and with relation to the specific scene the characters appear. How can we do that? We know by definition from the script who are the characters and where they are appearing. You saw I showed it to you. We know where the characters are. 
ok so now in order to identify the characters there is an important problem here which is i need to find out a tool i need to make a tool that tells me given a movie given a script these are the main characters ok so where am i going to find the data that tells me what the main characters are we didn't have this data it turns out you can do this by actually taking labels from the Wikipedia cast section. So if your movie is discussed in Wikipedia, it usually tells you who the main characters are. And so now using these Wikipedia labels, we can train a classifier where you come up with whatever features you like that tells you um, whether this character is main or not in the movie. And here there are three types of features. There's graph-based features, scene-based features, and linguistic features. And I'm going to show you examples of each. So we put, take these features, we put them in the classifier. In this case, it was a perceptron, but you can use whatever classifier you like, which will tell you that these guys here, Hannibal Lecter, Buffalo Bill, and Clarice, are main characters. Now, the silence of the lamp is actually quite, lamps is quite interesting. There is 60 characters altogether, and it's a very big script. And the movie is like two and a half hours. Uh, yes. So um, this is an example of the graph we create. It's a network of characters. Um, and these are the characters in the movie. The thicker edges here denote uh, co-occurrence of characters and interactions among them. And given this big graph, then you can create several features based on the connectivity of the graph that inform the classifier. Um, the other thing we do is we can actually identify the sentiment of specific characters, the sentiment of specific interactions, of specific utterances, and the sentiment of entire scenes. Um, here, this is the sentiment between Clarice and Dr. Lecter. And you can see that, uh, well, Dr. Lecter and Clarice, you can see that Dr. Lecter likes Clarice more than Clarice likes Dr. Lecter. <laughs> which is mutual. Uh, and you can see here the sentiment values of the different utterances. And then finally, uh, in par as part of our linguistic features, we actually extract attributes for these characters. And this is actual output of the system. I haven't handpicked it. So it says that Dr. Lecter is a serial killer, a monster, a psychiatrist, imprisoned, cannibal, psychopath. Uh, Clarice is young. It's not so good with Clarice, actually. She's young, an FBI trainee, pretty, ambitious, brave, moody. And this is all discussed in the script. Um, Buffalo Bill, who is the serial killer, is William Rubin. It turns out that he has two names. William Rubin is his given name, but everybody talks about him as Buffalo Bill. He's naughty, gum. He also has this gum name because he's a transsexual and he goes by gum. Anyway, so it picks up, it picks up all this. Uh, from the script. And we use these as features to identify the characters. OK, so, so far I talked about, you know, um, identifying the characters uh, on text. So if you have the script, how do you identify the characters? But I said to you that we also want to use the video. So the question is, how do you identify the characters in video? And it's quite simple and has been around for a long time. So this is not the science of the lamb is Buffy the vampire slayer. But um, you see that we can identify the faces in the video. OK, so we identify the faces here. And we also track so as to get rid of many faces. So we see if it's the same face in all of these shots. And so this is the time, right? And then once we have identified all the faces in the movie, then we can simply cluster them. And I'll explain how this works. So we extract the faces and we cluster them. And the assumption is that the face clusters correspond to characters. And that the M largest clusters are the main characters because that means that this person is in the movie a lot, which kind of makes sense. You know, if you're not, sometimes the main character is someone who appears like in some, some scene and disappears. But this is the exception. Usually, the way Hollywood works, actors have to be given face time. And that's why this works. In, in fact, it's in their contract. Like, actor X, Y, Z will appear 70 minutes or so. Um, and this is, you know, you have to do this. Also, in the trailer, they have contracts that say how many seconds the main character will appear. 
OK, so is that clear? So if you don't have the text, you just identify the faces, you cluster the faces. Hopefully, the faces are going to be coherent. But there is some interesting work in computer vision. This guy's here, um, Vu et al. They, they have developed an algorithm which we use that is specific for clustering faces and works very well. OK, and this is what you get if you just do what I said with the video without any script in the silence of the lambs. And you see it identifies here that you have these two important characters and others connected to them. OK, so like I said, the function we're trying to uh, maximize has three terms. I've only talked about the importance so far, um, about the coherence, scene to scene progression. There is two more terms, importance and diversity. So importance, again, can be defined in terms of the number of characters. So a scene is important if it contains a high number of characters. And in video, you can do other more interesting things, such as is the scene long or short? Does it have a large or small number of shots? Does it have too many or too few objects? And as for diversity, it's actually the opposite. Diverse scenes do not have many characters in common. You can also measure how well they overlap in terms of the sentiment. So a scene with a positive sentiment followed by a scene with a negative sentiment are diverse. Uh, two or three sent sentences that consecutive have the same sentiment aren't. And in video, again, you can uh, look at the number of objects being different, at the number of shots, at the runtime of a scene, which is actually I'm not sure if you need to be looking at short or long, but uh, usually longer scenes are less important than shorter ones. OK, so I'll, I'll talk now. So this is the main framework. Um, I'll give you some results how we've tested this on just screenplays, the scenario where this Hollywood reader is reading the script and wants a shorter version of it. And then I will talk about how we use this framework to generate trailers. And this is the more speculative part of the talk. You'll see the trailers. But um, so we assume we have 95, well, not we assume, we do have 95 movies. Um, and we uh, produce, this is another problem. How do you know what the important scenes are? Nobody has done this task before. So nobody has thought, oh, gee, we have to help the readers read their texts. So how do you know to train a system that, or at least to develop it, what scenes are important and which ones aren't. And it turns out you can use um, a framework called distance supervision, where you can extrapolate the label for a scene. And by label, I mean, should the scene be in the summary or out of the summary, by looking again at Wikipedia and at the summaries they create for a movie. So in Wikipedia, every movie gets a lengthy summary where they tell you what's happening in the movie. If we can align the sentences in the summary with our scenes, then we will assume that the scene is important and should be in the summary. So that way, you sort of simulate a gold standard, even if you don't have it. OK, and so we have our system, and we compared it to three baselines. One is basically taking apart the objective. One is doing only minimum overlap of characters, so only looking at diversity. The maximum overlap of character, which is only looking at importance, and a random scene selection, which is averaged over a thousand runs. And we optimize the function using linear programming. OK, so these are the movies on which we actually tested this with humans. Um, has anybody seen any of these movies? Which one have you seen? Nightmare, OK. So um, we pick these movies. So they're all terrible, actually. Uh, I, I can <laughs> do not see this one. I insist. I had to read all the scripts. Little Athens, nothing happens. It's horrendous. It's like these teenagers talking and talking and talking. I don't understand. OK, um, Living in Oblivion, there is a reason why I'm, I'm going over these movies. Living in Oblivion is really cool. It's perhaps the nicest. It's a dream sequence within a dream sequence. This is some guy falling in love with this girl. This is a, I guess, uh, oh god, 187. This is a school teacher, and some thugs uh, go after him. 
this is terrible, the anniversary party, awful, do not watch this. Again, uh, there's this, this couple and in the end they split up through this anniversary party. And so this is very good. The, okay, so the reason why I'm going through this is to show that these are very different movies. They have different structure, they're not all linear, and they're about different topics. But our system is agnostic to what the movie is like. It's a general purpose system. So we first had to pre-test this to make sure that people haven't actually seen them. And then the way we evaluated is we asked people questions. And the hypothesis is that the more questions the system can answer, the better it is at summarizing the script as a whole. So these are examples of questions that we ask the human. So the human is, sits there, they read the script, our summaries, our script summary. And in fact, I thought people cannot do this, but we got these comments where they said, oh, this is a fantastic. Do you have more scripts for me to read? And I go like, you guys are nuts. Anyway, <laughs> so um, they read the script and then they try to answer these questions which makes sure to test the content of the movie. So the hypothesis is the more um, the system is good if the produced summary is such that a person can answer these questions. So in addition with this, to these content questions, we ask them also to summarize the plot of the movie. What is this movie, is, what, what is the movie about? And we ask an additional question, which is what are the main characters? Because we wanted to see how we're doing. And here are the results. So green is us, uh, called Sinsum, and the rest is the baselines. And here is how well we answer all the questions, just the five content questions, just the plot question, and just the character question. And as you can see, the system is doing better than the baselines by far, like by maybe 5% on the all questions. Um, it's also doing well on the content questions and on the plot question, which is good. The plot is good because you don't want to mess up with the plot. And then finally, the characters are not so great. After all the effort we put into this, you see that the characters are better with just the baseline of the minimum overlap. And there is a reason about this, because usually the way we train the system, um, Wikipedia turns to place a lot of emphasis on unique occurrences. And we didn't take this into account. Anyway, but we thought this is encouraging. Um, so let me now move on to the trailer and profile generation part of the talk. OK, so how can we generate a trailer? So the input here is a video, which is segmented into scenes and subshots. And we have done this before. We know the scenes and we know the subshots via the alignment I showed you earlier. So our goal is to output a movie trailer. And I should have uh, written here, subject to a compression rate. And the compression rate in this case is the number of minutes that Hollywood wants the trailers to be. So it cannot be more than two minutes and 30 seconds. So we can select first a subchain of scenes. So we will go and run the algorithm and select the scenes using both textual and visual information. And then for each scene, we will select another subchain of shots. Remember, every scene is segmented into shots. And then we can construct a trailer T by stitching together the selected shots. Now, um, this is all very good here. It's actually quite simple and straightforward. Um, I will show you the system output on the silence of the lambs. And bear in mind, we're still developing this. Um, so there are some obvious things you'll see after you see the trailer that we need to do. OK. Internships, the Reisinger Clinic. It says here, when you graduate, you want to come to work for me in behavioral science. Yes. Yeah. I'm still in training at the academy. Jack Crawford sent a trainee to me. Yes, I'm a student. I'm here to learn from you. Maybe you can decide for yourself whether or not I'm qualified enough to do that. Mm -hmm. That is rather slippery of you, Agent Starling. Sit, please. If you didn't kill him, then who did, sir? Oh! 
extend you every courtesy, but right now. Okay. So, uh, you yeah, thank you, thank you, two times. <laughs> okay. So, um, once we did this, we realized that there is this golden rule in film studies that if you generate a trailer, a scene cannot be less than 30 seconds because the attention, uh, you, you have too many, pro a person in order to get the story has to fixate on the video for 30 minutes of the same scene. And this is a constraint that we don't have. And you can see that it switches from one scene to the next really fast. Now, we also take the, the, the music from the movie. A professional tra trailer would not have this. It would have a voiceover and specific music for the trailer. Okay, so um, uh, we need to do some more work on this. In particular, take this constraint. And there is another constraint that is very easy to do, but we haven't done this. Never show the end. In fact, uh, some, um, there is some work on uh, multimedia analysis, and they cut the movie. The last 10 minutes, they cut it, they take it away, and then they generate the trailer. So we didn't do this because we wanted to see how, what would it do. Okay, uh, I'll show you also Shrek. Uh, the video of Shrek, and, it, and it's interesting because Shrek is like not people. It's an animated movie, uh, and you can tell me which one you think is worse. Once upon a time, there was a lovely princess, but she had an enchantment upon her of a fearful sort, which could only be broken by love's first kiss. She was locked away in a castle, guarded by a terrible fire-breathing dragon. Many brave knights had attempted to free her from this dreadful prison, but none prevailed. She waited in the dragon's keep, in the highest room of the tallest tower, for... The kind of, I don't care what nobody thinks of me thing. I like that, I respect that trick. You all right. Woo, look at that. Who's gonna live in a place like that? That would be my home. Oh, and it is lovely, just beautiful. You know, you are quite a decorator. It's amazing what you've done with such a modest budget. I like that boulder. That is a nice boulder. Been caught in the rain. Yours for the rescue. That must be Lord Farquaad's castle. Uh-huh, that's the place. Wow. Let's do that again. No, 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 no. Take drastic steps. Kick to the curb. Don't mess with me. I'm the stair master. I've mastered the stairs. I wish I had a step right here, right here, and now I step all over it. Blue flower, red thorns. Blue flower, red thorns. Blue flower, red thorns. This would be so much easier if I wasn't colorblind. Blue flower, red thorns. Blue flower, red Ow! thorns. Hold on, Shrek. I'm coming. I wanted to show you before. This is really the end of the movie. Yes. OK, so uh, we are in the middle of evaluating these trailers with some obvious baselines, such as, you know, how do you sele randomly select uh, shots from the movie? Uh, another talk, this would be. Um, so let me finish with uh, talking about generating movie 
profiles. So uh, I showed you Gini, and I, I told you that we managed to scrape Gini before, before it was actually uh, not available anymore. And so for all these movies in the corpus I talked about, we have these labels. And the labels are tags of the content of the movie, such as, you know, special agents, mind games, thriller, crime, and so on. And we are not exactly sure how the Gini people created those, but we uh, seriously suspect that they had some experts who went there and annotated. And um, it could be then that, you know, in-house, there were no experts anymore, but they could do it quite reliably. Okay, so, um, the problem of actually taking a movie and generating the labels is an instance of a multi-label classification problem. And the way we did this, and in case you were wondering, this is the only, the only well, this one and the next one. Uh, no, this slide has the mention of neural networks. I thought I was going to give the talk without mentioning neural networks, but it was impossible. So um, in this case, we use this uh, SPEN, uh, which I do recommend it, actually. It's a very nice tool. Um, developed at UMass, and this is a neural network that performs multi-label classification and can take into account correlations of labels quite efficiently, and it's very good. We tried several other tools, and, and this performed by far the best. So uh, the question is, of course, what features you give to the multi-label classifier, and we have done several experiments, and the punchline is if you have features based on text, and video together, you do very well. And in fact, any other variety where you only use the text or you only use the video doesn't work. So they are complementary. So uh, this slide here shows the how well our system, which is the purple one, performs against the actual Gini labels. So this is the gold standard. This is predicted against gold. And you see that the Gini labels do very well, but our system is sort of approaching this. Um, and this is the, these are the four, well, no, one, two, three, four, five, six labels that have to do with attitude, flag, whether it's obscene or not, the genre of the movie, which is in some sense the most important one, uh, the mood, whether it's somber, like Silence of the Lambs, or happy, like Shrek, the place where it took place, and the plot. So what is the movie about? Um, and then this is all labels. So uh, Genie does 92% accuracy, and we are quite close. Okay, so then um, once you have these labels, the question is what do you do with them? Uh, and we want to generate this profile that tells you what the movie is about. So you could do this in multiple ways. You could have a template where you fill slots of what the movie is about. But we tried this um, neural network model, which is an instance of this paradigm called encoder-decoder, where the encoder encodes the labels that the classifier gives you, and the decoder tries to generate the summary or the profile of the movie. So I'll show you an example. So this is the Bourne identity. Um, and these are the actual uh, labels that our system predicted. As you can see, it predicts a lot of labels. In fact, it is a difficult problem because for some of these genes, we have maybe a hundred labels. Okay, so these are the categories and these are the exact genes. And you see that for attitude, it says that it's fast, realistic, serious, for flag, profanity, strong, violent content, and so on. And you don't need all of these to generate the profile. So the neural network figures out on its own which ones of these are important and how to generate them. And I'll show you the system output for the Born identity. Um, it says the Born identity can be described, and the red, the, the, the red words here are the ones that the network picked to talk about. Uh, so the Born identity can be described as rough and exciting. The plot centers around on the run, chases and races, and state affairs. The main genre is action. The pacing is fast. Note that the Bourne identity involves strong, violent content. Two things to uh, note from this. The neural networks can actually generate grammatical text. And B, uh, it's actually not that bad. It sort of focuses on important labels for the movie. And even though this is not an actual summary, it doesn't tell you what happens in the Bourne identity, it tells you what the movie is about. Okay. So um, what uh, do we plan to do next? Um, so 
one interesting, I think, application is um, the setting of recommender systems where we have a movie, The Silence of the Lamps, and we can ask the system to find you um, similar movies. And this, I think, is very interesting because the similarity of the movies cannot be only like visual. It has to be the content, what, this movie, what the movie is about. Um, so we haven't done this. This is future work. And another thing that I, I, I believe is very important, I haven't talked at all about audio. I haven't talked at all about speech. I haven't just said anything about what the music does, what the music doesn't do, but these are very important. If you talk to uh, film people, I gave this talk at Columbia and there were some people who work in Hollywood or anyway. So the Hollywood people came to me and they said, but you're not using the music, what's wrong with you? And they're absolutely right. So the music gives you cues as to which scenes are important and the same with the speech. So if you want to do it completely multimodal, I mean, this is, this is the goal. You would have the music and you would analyze the speech um, and see you know, where people are shouting, where they're not shouting, and try to generate a, a more sort of comprehensible trailer. Okay, so thank you. We have time for questions. Yes. Um, so something that somebody in Hollywood does, directors as far as I know, is take a full movie and then slightly shorten it. And that seems somewhat similar to creating a trailer just from the other yeah. end. But in practice, do you think you'll have to tune a lot of knobs or do you just flip a few bits somewhere? And yeah, it's a very good question. So it depends a bit. If it is like I have like this long movie and I want to make it shorter, then I don't actually need to tune a lot of knobs. I can just give different system output with different parameters, such as the compression, or I only need diversity, or I want importance, or whatever. If I need to generate a trailer, I think it's naive to think that this trailer will actually uh, be good enough. And to give you an example, I don't know whether you've seen this movie, Morgan. It's about AI, and the people who distributed Morgan went to IBM. And they said to IBM, can you please produce a trailer automatically for the movie Morgan, which is about this AI agents and whatever, killing each other. And so what they did in IBM, they said, sure. And they took the movie and they applied only computer vision, um, detecting how scenes differ from one another. And they produced the trailer. And then what did they do? They kind of cheated. They manually selected the, the, the shots to actually show, because it's not good enough. So I think. If one is very serious about the trailers, it needs a lot of tuning. If we just need to shorten and give candidates to the developer to see and explore different things, I think we're almost there. Can you use real trailers to do supervised learning? Yes, we are in the process of doing this, but there is a very big problem there. Um, there is very many negative labels and very few positive ones. So if you do it on the shot level, so you, sub, you, know, you segment the movie into shots, you get like a thousand shots per movie where 20 are positive and the other ones are negative. And you know you need to do a lot of tricks to deal with the label imbalance problem. But this is absolutely right. And I mean, I think this is a direction we should explore. Yes. Yeah. This may be a little silly, but um, you were talking about the voiceovers. There's always that guy who goes, in a world where, you know, something like that. Um, how hard is it to generate those kind of summaries in uh, it's, you know, it's different than what you're doing here because uh, it's really trying to be a teaser and so it's maybe more copywriting you know, or, or advertising writing. This is not silly at all, actually. This is a very good point. So we haven't actually tried to do this, but I do not think it would be that difficult. You could even collect uh, synopsis. So every movie has a synopsis. You can find it publicly available. And then by sort of doing some processing of the synopsis, which is exactly what you're saying, in this uh, city, whatever, whatever, you could generate something, the, the voiceover, and that's actually a good suggestion. We, we could do, once we have a decent trailer, we could look into doing this. And also some, some trailers don't have voiceovers. They just have music, but I think the music is very important. Um, and we're not doing anything, we're just cutting scenes with their, their own music, which, yeah. Yes. Um, have you thought about generating audio description for movies to make them accessible to blind users? Ah, That's that what I consider to be a real problem. That is really interesting. Okay, so um, 
Uh, no, but I don't think it would be so uh, unfeasible. There is some work. I mean, it depends a bit. Okay, so uh, for the entire movie, I think it would be difficult. For a short trailer or for a summary version, it would be maybe doable. The bottleneck there would be the computer vision, which I don't think is robust enough to deploy it. I mean, identifying the objects, and I didn't talk about this here, but we have something that uh, does not label the objects that tells you, is this an object or not? Um, in order to generate the descriptions, you would have to at least identify some labels. The characters would be easy. So you can say here you have Clarice and Dr. Sterling talking to each other. That would be okay. But saying you pick up this object and you do some action with it, I think that would be difficult. It seems you could use the script because the script has a description of what's happening. and you could. Yes, you could use the script, but um, you could uh, then, okay, so for the summary, you, could, uh, you need to uh, get rid also of the uh, directions, that the, the, you know, the director's things. But maybe that wouldn't be so hard. Yeah. That wouldn't be, and then we have some speech that actually generates a description. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So, so I love that you were very explicit about the kind of theoretical assumption coming from the humanities that the only thing that's important is the characters. That's what they say. I mean, and, I, and I mean, I'm glad that your model actually like models characters because you know the, the the current tendency in these kinds of things would be to just throw it all into an LSTM and you know characters are are what they are in the in the embedded space and they get completely lost. I want to I wonder if you think that that you could get more if you had more explicit representations of other things that might matter in movies like plots and storylines and character development and how characters change over time or abstractions over characters. Yeah, like if you talk to great. people in the humanities who, yes. who study this kind of stuff, they're going to have a language for, for talking about more than just the characters. So um, I think this is interesting. And I think this is a direction we should definitely go into. Um, the problem is, A, you need some collaborators that know about what it is that you are looking to find in the movies. And um, I am not, I mean, the NLP angle, you could potentially do it. Um, and I think you need to identify, you know, the trajectory because there's a lot of work also on the development of characters over time and the changes. And this would definitely give you better stories. I'm not sure about the trailers because they're trying to be obfuscated. You know, they don't actually want you to understand because if you understand that the movie's crap, you're not going to go. Um, and you're taping me now saying crap. Anyway, okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm just, not, this is much less of a high level question, but I'm curious. So, some directors are known for deviating heavily from the screenplay that they're given. Has this been a problem in practice? Excellent question. Excellent. Okay, so this happens. And there are, uh, for the Silence of the Lamb, there is two scripts, actually. Uh, the official version, and then uh, there is a second script, and also there are some changes. So this happens more often than you would like it to be the case, but because we are, in the case where we're using the video as well, it doesn't really matter that much because this is some more information that you get from the video. In the case of the script, it is added noise. So yes, it does matter and you're not going to be perfect, but we have to deal with it. Yeah. It seems like a lot of trailers also try to optimize for some sort of tone, perhaps, and they want to convey the tone of the movie. There's even cases where people made their own trailers to work against the tone of the movie, so they get a comedic trailer from the horror movie. Yes, so the tone of the movie is, uh, is a very good point, and in fact, there is a whole book about you know, how the tone of the movie should be. We thought about it, but it's not completely clear to us how to actually formalize the tone. I mean, we could perhaps look at visual sentiment of the movie. So there is some work on, you know, this scene is positive sentiment and negative sentiment. We could look into music, but we don't know enough about, you know, I would want a classification of different tones, and I don't have this. If I had this, maybe we could start looking at actually making it something concrete. But it's a good point. It's a good point. And humans, of course, can tell you what the tone is. Uh, it's just that the machine is not a human. Yeah. Yeah. It's providing some of those tone keywords to the movie, right? Yes, this is a good point. These things here give you sort of what the movie is about. But to convey this in the tone of the thriller, so I showed you the, the in the tone of the trailer, I showed you the, the trailer of the Silence of the Lamb. 
how would you how would you describe the tone? So somebody said to me, it's very dark. So you know the thing picks up on dark scenes. Um, so you could talk about the tone in these terms, but actually conveying it in a way that an audience, if you're a tester audience for Hollywood, uh, that would be a bit more difficult. So it, it had to identify scenes as having like strong violent content, right? Yes. You couldn't say yes. these are the scenes that we want to use because they match that. Yes, we could do that. And another thing, since you are bringing this up, the other thing that we could do is have. Um, user-based trailers. So a user could say, I want only the violent scenes. Okay, but this, bear in mind, this is done on the entire movie. Now we would have to go and annotate every, like we would have to tag individual scenes and then it gets more complicated because we don't have labels, but yes. Or you could say, I want all scenes with Clarice Starling having a positive sentiment. Okay, it's like the future. Okay, we should probably stop now, and Morella uh, will be joining us in the atrium for refreshments starting oh, now. Refreshments? So, yeah. Okay. yeah, we'll Excellent. see you upstairs. Thank Thanks you again. Guys.